without any waste of time, I would like to call upon our first speaker, who is Mr. Victor Lechiava. Victor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Program Director. And I would like to greet um, everybody out there, school children, uh, fellow presenters, and the fellow heritage practitioners or museum workers who, who are working at the Kruger Museum or in Zong or at Zong. Yes, um, I think the program director have said a little bit about myself quickly. I'm a heritage practitioner um, with a track record in heritage management, but I'm currently attached to a heritage site and a monument called you know, Phoenix you know, Park. My, my designation there is a chief curator. And I should indicate that um, qualification wise, I hold a master's degree in conservation um, of built environment, that is MPhil in conservation of built environment from University of Cape Town. But quickly to the subject matter, yes, I had the program director saying, I'm going to speak about Paul Kruger, um, the man, um, as well as, um, the war, the South African war, as other would like to actually um, call it that way. So I'm, I'm very much glad to be the speaker today for the simple reason that uh, my thesis when I did my master's focused on memorial landscape with special focus on um, Paul Kruger monument in Victoria, where I was questioning the general public, or um, I was content to find out what are the feelings and how the public opine about this statue and many others that are of the same category. To the subject matter, I'm going to focus on not Paul Puga men, as per se, I will touch um, on certain aspect of his leadership or a certain aspect of his role as the president of the South African Republic. But I would like to relate my topic um, with or my presentation or tie it with the subject matter of the day, anti-bullying and child abuse by actually looking at bullying characteristics and attitude and the way in which they were manifested or their form in as far as the South African war was actually concerned. And I'm going to look at it from two perspectives. That is, how do we see the bullying characteristics and attitude? That is, when Britain wanted to actually annex the South African Republic. And secondly, after the war, when both British citizens and Boers having formed an alliance and having agreed uh, after the armistice of the history of free energy and um, which led to the establishment of the union, whereby they ganged against black Africans and the resist nature of the South African Republic, um, I would like to look at it being a substratum or the base of a resist apartheid policy. Um, during my research, some defended the monument of Paul Kruger by saying Kruger was not the father of apartheid regime, but his ideology, I would argue, it laid the foundation for the African nationalism, which led to the 1948 victory of the National Party. And from there, we see a myriad of laws and the institutionalization of laws that were pro-apartheid, on which were resist and um, the institutionalization of apartheid and racism. And for me, that whole policy and the government that came into being, which was then uh, crashed in 1994, um, 
had a lot in relation to bullying behavior. Quickly, the war between um, the Boers or the South African Republic and the British government took place for a, I mean, between it started in on the 11th of October, 1899, and it ended up in 1902. This long got protracted for about um, three years. But let me touch on something. The title says Anglo War Award. You know, people would prefer or prefer to actually call it. Um, or name it or describe it in different names. Others would call it Boer War, other would call it a South African War, other would call it Anglo Boer War. But I should indicate that of late, um, there is a remarkable level of uh, consensus or agreement by historians pending or as a result of latest research of this particular war that uh, for it to be inclusive, let us call it South African war. Why would I say so? Um, it is South African war, or I would prefer that it be South African war. Um, for few reasons. Africans participated in this war in both sides. Also victims of the war. In particular, this um, destroyed them people as well as um, the Boers. So Africans lost job during this war. They were caught in between the siege that took place. They were evicted also from their own farms or their land. They served as after rares in people who were like spies, you know, who would you know search for information or happening on the other side groups that were at loggerhead and victims. The war broke out in between coming out of the Napoleonic War and when they were to head to be, to be, to be participating in the World War War I because the World War I broke out in 1915 and the war the, the, the South African War ended up in 1902. Now, this was a very disastrous war. And uh, it was fought not on equal footing. Um, because the British Empire had about 500,000 men, whereas the Boers, the Boers or the, 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 the beggars, or the, uh, the Transvaal Republic and the Orange State Republic, they had only 88,000 um, soldiers. Now, Maybe it will be critical that we ask ourselves the question, what was exactly the cause of the war? The cause of the war was simple. Knowing Britain, but the fact that um, they were imperialists, empire, you no know, global sovereignty. In other words, they claim sovereignty of bearing you no know, unquestionable authority, ruling authority over the other person. And this is what the 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 the, the, the South African Republic didn't want. That is why Paul Kruger is actually regarded as a hero, because he fought tooth and nail to ensure that deserve the sovereignty and the rights and the African dome, or the identity of the Boers or the beggars as they were actually called. Now, most 
critical aspect that triggered the war, it was the establishment, not the establishment, but the discovery of the gold um, at Witwatersrand in 1886. Now, the gold complex in Witwatersrand, which was located um, within the area of jurisdiction of the South African Air Republic, it was, it was, it was, it was in a complex of rich minerals that Britain didn't have control over, because Britain at that particular point in time had or ruled two colonies in South Africa. That was uh, Natal as well as the Cape Co uh, Colony. Now, one of the critical issues was the world monetary system which was dependent mainly on gold. And this triggered um, Britain to expand its own control in Southern Africa, in such that they wanted to jealously control and to actually own these resources. And that in a sense triggered this war. Now, the gold uh, discovery brought modernization to the South African Republic. And in that way, they were at par in terms of competing with Britain. And that is what Britain uh, didn't actually like. Britain wanted resources to boost the empire economy. And looking at it, one would say their interest over these mineral resources was to boost the economy of the empire, whereas the role played by or the position of the South African Republic in wanting to defend they, themselves was mainly for patriotic reason. They didn't want the resources to actually go out of the country, but they wanted to build um, the country, although the resources and the government that was in power by then was an exclusive government. And the only people who enjoyed the benefits of those resources and the government were only white people, and blacks were not actually the the, 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 the beneficiaries. Now, what happened now here is we find a situation where Alfred Milner, being the leader of the British um, colony, he wanted um, certain reforms. He made demands to the Boer Republic and the demand was that there should be an allowance of um, English citizen in the political life of the Boer Republic. A number of occasions, Paul Kruger made concessions to those demands, but that was not good enough for the British uh, government. Now, in, in 1899, the president of um, Orange Free State, that is um, President Stey, convened a conference between Alfred Milner and President Kruger to discuss this whole issue of concessions and the demands that were made by the British government. And uh, Britain was not actually interested in that. Instead, they increased the number of troops on the border of the South African Republic, which shocked uh, Paul Kruger and his um, folks, 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 folks Rad government. And Kruger again considered, he made some more further concessions, but again, Britain was not satisfied. So the question that arises here is what exactly was Britain um, interested in? Britain was not interested in quotations in, in, in political forms, reforms which would South African and British citizens to be um, accommodated in the political life of um, the, the Z African Republic. Their issue was they wanted the mineral resources. As we know, the empire, wherever they actually colonize, their interest is to actually um, exploit the resources and um, you know, boost the economy of uh, 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 um, the British Empire. That is why you'll find that the even the British um, 
um, um, home, say of the queen, you'll find that even the gates are, you know, they, they are they are made of, of gold. And the queen herself, she's very much she's think rich in the world, and they have unprocessed um, repositories of gold, blocks and blocks and blocks of gold. And you ask yourself, where did they get that? Because Britain is not actually known for being rich in, in mineral resources. So basically, it was not all about political concession. It was about the resources. And they kept on pressurizing Paul Kruger and the, the Forbes Rudd government to say, um, we want political, uh, what do you call, concessions, and, and, and we want reforms. And in actual fact, they claimed so sovereignty to say, you guys, you are under our authority. And in other words, you must allow us to do as we want, which is what Paul Kruger didn't actually want. And that, in actual fact, uh, led to the declaration of the war. In 1899, Kruger, Kruger actually declared the war, the state of the war, to say, given that stalemate, we therefore declaring the war um, against you, the British uh, people. The war was fought, and uh, to sum it up quickly, Britain came out the victors, and it led to the peace treaty, which was actually um, 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 signed in 1902, which is called the Peace Treaty of Perienege. Here, the role players from the Boer side was. Uh, Louis Botta and uh, Jean Smart. Um, at that point in time, at the end of the war, the, the British army or the Brit, not the British army, I'm sorry, the, the Boers were actually divided. There were those who were raising their hands up to say we are losers and those who were still wanting to push on and to fight for their own sovereignty. But uh, Louis Botta and Smart convinced everybody to say, no, let us accept but provided that um, we have what you call local self-government. And that led to an alliance of both Boers and British. Now, you need to actually again pick up here the other um, element, or bullying element, which is the agreement of the resolution that Britain and the Boers um, they've undertook, you know, which was the alliance against black people. So from that day, when the union was created, black people were not actually included in the political life of the union itself. And the African nationalism was not actually totally killed or it was not necessarily dead. It was still alive. There were still African nationalists who were still um, championing the cause of uh, Africanadom, even when they were still under the, 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 the rule of British Empire. And you will recall, or I would indicate that throughout the whole um, history of the African um, 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 government, up to 1948, you would see a situation wherein Paul Kruger statue was actually mobilized as a cultural product in the interest of nationalism, simply because he was regarded as a hero, as a leader, a person who fought for African Adam. And that is why even when they relocated his own statue and they placed it in the Czech Square where it's currently placed, if you listen to the tone of speeches, they were anti-Britain, but pro-African nationalism simply because he is the person who didn't even look back in terms of fighting for the cause of African people. So basically, that is um, how this war actually uh, unfolded. Now, one would say, when we assess this war, a number of African people uh, died in the concentration camps, and a number of it is, it is actually estimated that about 15,000 to 20,000 African people, they died in this uh, particular war, but they were never recorded simply because the policy 
of the then government up to 1948 and even up to 1994 did not consider African people as human beings. We were regarded as half human or African people were regarded as half human or not human or not existing at all. So that is what I'm saying. We also see the other form of bullying um, coming out of this war, which became the background of the African nationalism and the African um, nationalist and racist policies, which led to the creation of the apartheid um, regime. So we wouldn't say Paul Kruger was the father of apartheid, but he laid foundation because his policies were racist. Apartheid came into being um, um, through guys like um, Trado. But they actually looked back and they resuscitated or they regurgitated the very same ideology um, that was actually espoused by Paul Kruger and the African nationalist movement who were actually um, pro um, African and uh, who were preserving the African identity. I think uh, program director, um, it, I would say it's enough if I, I stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor, for that interesting information. From what I get from you is that bullying is mainly about power and control and making people feel less than what they are in order to control them. So thank you very much. And now I would like to call on our next speaker, who is Marit Conradi. Marit, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk on this webinar. I am specifically going to talk about the curriculum um, we have looked at the curriculum, the school curriculum, and we saw that in life orientation, grade seven in the second quarter, um, this is where abuse or bullying then fits in. Um, I am Marit Conradi, like Bongi introduced me. I am the education officer and I work at Ditsong Kruger Museum. So I'm going to focus on what the curriculum says, but there are different parts. I'm going to tell you about bullying and then also um, just give you a few practical tips what to do about if you are being bullied. Sometimes people don't even know that they are being bullied. Um, they are, first of all, there are different, you can look at abuse in different contexts. They are um, children can be abused by adults, or they can be children can abuse other adults. Uh, children can abuse, yes, I suppose children, teenagers can abuse their parents as well. But um, I'm going to focus on peer group of bullying. Bullying is an act of violence. And when, you, when a child abuses another child, we talk about, we use the word bullying. So abuse amongst peers um, is an act of aggression when somebody bullies you, and it can be direct or indirect. If it's direct, it is when somebody physically kicks you or slaps you. Um, it can also be when they tease you or when they steal something from you. When it's indirect, um, that is if a child ignores you or spreads stories about you. And then today we have cyberbullying. And cyberbullying is when somebody sends you threatening emails or if they send you viruses or even if they take photos and they place that on um the internet without your permission to use those pictures. 
So let's look at school and elsewhere because our target audience today is grade four, five, six, and seven. Um, so at school and elsewhere, the first thing you must do is to identify threatening situations or risky situations. Now, the, the first thing you need to do is to listen to your gut. You know, we all have a gut feeling and it is said that especially women um, or children, uh, um, young uh, children, have ladies have a better gut feel than men. Um, I will also often say to my husband, listen, Ravi, I feel such and such and so. And then when he listens to me, then we both say, you know, you were right. So listen to your gut. If, you, if there's a risky situation and you don't want to go, then don't go, don't do it, listen to your gut. But I just want to say, I don't only talk to ladies today. I don't only talk, um, I, I, I also talk to boys today. So, um, because both boys and girls can be bullied. And we actually decided on this webinar, based on just before COVID started, there were a lot of incidences at school where boys would stab other boys with, with knives and, and they were killings. And these are children killing one another at school. It is totally unacceptable. So um, identifying threat, um, threatening or risky situations. If somebody is cruel to animals, stay away from them. Somebody that's cruel to animals will possibly be become a bully and they will bully persons as well. And when somebody is angry or highly emotional, you also need to stay away from them. When people abuse substances such as alcohol or drugs, you also stay away from them because um, when somebody um, drinks too much, they will, they can get aggressive, they probably will get aggressive and they will uh, their personalities change, and they will bully you. They will take it out on you. Remember that it's not your fault if you are being bullied. We are all responsible for our own actions, our own words, and our own reactions, and our own behavior. Then I'd like to talk about the effects of abuse on personal and social health and relationships. It is normal for a child to be, when you are bullied, you often feel sad, lonely, confused, useless, depressed, good for nothing, angry, you, have, you feel different from your peers, you feel overwhelmed, and you feel distrustful of people. So if you feel, if you have any of those feelings, then you are possibly being bullied by somebody. Then how to protect yourself from threatening or risky situations? Um, avoidance. Like I said, use your gut, stay away. If, if somebody invites you for something, sort of meet me after school, I want to show you something nice, but you know that this person has not reacted nicely towards you. Don't go, listen to your gut, don't go, avoid the situation. Then stay out of sight, especially if adults, I know I'm focusing now on school children, on, on abuse, bullying between school children. But if adults are, are getting into a fight, stay away, go away. It's not your problem. It's not for you to intervene. If you want to intervene, go to the police, report that to the police. Um, never get in the middle of a dangerous situation. Go somewhere else. If there's danger around you, avoid it. Go away. Go to a place where you are safe and where you feel good. And then get help. Communicate, communicate, communicate. The importance of communication to promote healthy and nonviolent relationships. If you are bullied or abused, 
preferably tell an adult that you trust. It can be a teacher at school, or it can be an adult, it can be your own parents, or it can be an aunt, it can be somebody you trust, somebody that you must trust. And then if you tell your teacher at school, if you are being bullied at school, um, your teacher must report child abuse. And the teacher commits a crime if he or she does not report the matter. So please, it's important if you are bullied at school and you go to your teacher and the matter is not reported, then go to the go to to the headmaster and say, listen, I've spoken to my teacher. It's not being reported. Please help me. It is your right to do, to do that. Then um, places of protection for victims of abuse. Like I said, go to a teacher or an adult that you trust. You can also phone Childline. It's a toll-free number, and the number is 0800. 055555. So it's an easy number um, to remember. I'm going to repeat it. It is 0800-055555. Then you can go to a social worker. Social workers know how to deal with abuse they, and bullying. They will know how to assist you. You can go to a child protection officer of the SAPS, um, the South African Police Service, and then um, communicate, communicate, communicate. We so often, when you are being bullied, you want, you think you are the baddie, but you are, you are the victim. So don't retract into yourself and go and sit in your corner and be a victim. Don't be a victim. Uh, it's your choice. There's enough people that can help you. So I want to end off this webinar by giving you advice. And it's just two things. It's like a takeaway. The one is um, do not hide because you feel ashamed, but join a group something that you like, let's say you're good in sports, then start playing netball, a group sport where you, where you can make new friends, um, healthy friends, nice friends. Friends, it's very good to have friends. Friends, um, friends will protect you. And then don't, the second thing and the last thing is don't be ashamed. Talk about it if you are being bullied. It doesn't matter whether it's a small um, something that happens to you or whether it's something big. Bullying is bullying and you have rights and there are many places that you can go to for help. So don't be a victim. Don't be bullied. Stand up for yourself, not against the bully, but follow the right procedures. Go to somebody that can help you. I thank you. Thank you very much, Marit. Yes, I think it is important to remember that it is not your fault. If you are being bullied, it is never your fault. It can never be your fault. And it is important to ask for help. Help is always available. If you speak, do not keep quiet. Speak up and you will be helped. I would like to call our next speaker to the floor who will be talking to us about constitutional rights. Dr. Pandalane Matoma, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, uh, Ms. Lekwase. Um, and, and I also would like to greet everybody, all the participants, and uh, most importantly, uh, the learners. Um, because really, this topic is about them and, and, and their rights. Um, so I would like to thank um, um, Mr. Necheava for giving us the history which, which gives the context and the background to where we are today uh, with the South African war and the lessons we learned. Uh, and also to thank Ms. Conradi, you know, defining what we mean by um, bullying 
and, and all the anti-bullying uh, strategies and tactics that we must put in place and most importantly, the rights that uh, the learners have uh, in this respect. And, and thank you for emphasizing that uh, chairperson. Um, my, my task is to speak about the constitution. And I think it's very important because uh, the learners uh, need to understand that they have constitutional rights. Uh, and these rights um, are enshrined in chapter two of the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. We, we commonly refer to the constitution as the 1996 constitution, because that is the year on the 16th of December, 1996, that our late uh, president Nelson Mandela uh, officially and formally launched the, the constitution that we have today. And so from the Bill of Rights on, in chapter two, um, we find all the rights that every South African, including the learners, uh, are entitled to. And, and at this point, let me just remind um, the learners that the president of the Republic of South Africa today, uh, Mr. Matamela Cyril Ramaphosa, and Mr. Rolf Meyer were the main architects of the constitution that we have today. And so the president knows a lot about it because he was one of the chief architects. And so the, let me get specifically now to the rights. Um, and the first one is, um, is, is the right, it's, it's, it's the fact that the constitution is the, is the cornerstone, is the basic law of the Republic of South Africa. What that means is that there is no other law which is above the constitution. So if, if there's a conflict between any other law, the place we go to is the constitutional court, which is going to confirm what the constitution says with regards to the rights. So, so that's the first thing. That's the, it is the cornerstone of our democracy. It is the main stone of where our democracy is upheld. Um, and the first right is the right to life. So every learner, and I, I need to emphasize this because particularly here in Gauteng, we have had instances that everybody knows of, uh, of, of learners being stabbed um, at school and some of them have died. And you've seen the MEC of education, Mr. Panyaza Lusufi, every time there's an incident, he rushes to the school. And, and, and because, and what has come out is that there are gangs in the schools. And that's why some of the, uh, the, the, the learners get killed. Um, but what those gang leaders and the members of the gangs don't know or, or, or are ignorant of is the fact that everybody has the right to life. And so when you go to school, you must be protected. You must go there and go back home uh, being safe. And, and so that's your right. That's everybody's right. And, and it's non-negotiable because it's a right that was given to everybody by the creator. It was given to us by God. So nobody, no gang leader, no other student has the right to take the life of other learners. So that's the first one and very important. The second one is that every learner has got the right. This is from the constitution. Um, um, the, the right to life is actually um, section 11 of the constitution. Um, and so the other one is the right to human dignity, um, which is, is the section 10 of the constitution. So what do we mean by human dignity? What we mean is that every learner deserves respect from the other learners to be treated with respect, uh, particularly in the way that we speak to them, whether it's the teachers, the educators, and the other learners. When you speak to the other learners, you speak to them with respect and you respect um, them as human beings um, because we, we all are created by God and the constitution recognizes that right. 
The, the third one um, is, is the right, everybody, every learner is equal before the law. And so what do we mean by that? Let me explain. Uh, this is the right which comes from the constitution and of course the Department of Education in the province and also the districts, uh, the school districts and also the school itself would have what we call a code of conduct. So the code of conduct tells the other learners in terms of how they must behave towards the other learners. So it's important that um, everybody is, tried, is, is treated as equal before the law. Everybody must respect what the law says and everybody must respect again, the rules and the regulations of the school consent. Um, everyone also has the right, this is the fifth right. Uh, everyone has, every learner has the right to freedom and to security. Uh, what do I mean by freedom? Uh, freedom, it's uh, the thing that South Africa, we fought for this freedom for a very long time. Um, when, when Mr. Nechiaba was referring to the South African war, actually the British, who were the colonizers of South Africa at the time, were bullying the Africaners and, and, and the rest of South Africans, including Blacks, as he had indicated, also fought in that war. So we did not want to be bullied by colonial powers. Um, and so we needed the freedom to make our own decisions. So what does it mean today? It means every learner has got the right to make their own decisions, the right, the choice. They can choose. Um, they are given that right to choose. Um, and also they have the right to security. Uh, security meaning that they must feel safe um, whenever they are in the school environment. Um, they need to be protected. Uh, and again, as I said, they don't need to be bullied um, by other learners or anybody else or the gangs. Um, and, and this right to freedom and security also includes the following. Uh, the right um, to be free from all forms of violence. Uh, Ms. Conradi referred to this one. So violence, uh, people fighting in the schools, it's not allowed. And people beating other, learners beating other learners, it's not allowed. Um, and, and let me indicate um, to you, let me just give you an example here when we talk about violence. There is somebody that most of the learners would know uh, his name is Elon Musk. Um, he's he's, he's an, an American entrepreneur. Uh, he is still a South African. I was double checking my information this morning. He has not renounced his South African citizenship. Um, and, and so he still proudly holds the South African citizenship. What is my point in mentioning Elon Musk? Elon Musk is a multi-billionaire. Uh, the latest uh, figure that I saw this morning, he is worth about 97.8 billion, billion dollars. It's a lot of money. But he, as a, South as a child in South Africa, before he went to the United States, he was bullied um, at a school in Johannesburg. He was bullied. He was actually um, the other learners violently attacked him. They actually threw him off from a flight of stairs at the school that he was attending in Berea in Johannesburg. So you can understand that bullying happens to everybody, but people do survive um, bullying like, like Elon Musk did. He actually was taken to hospital because of the way he was violently um, beaten up by the other learners. And today, because he survived it, today he is a multi-billionaire. And he's also, even though he lives in America, but he's also flying the South African flag. Elon Musk actually takes uh, people to space now. Uh, he's got a company called SpaceX and another one called Tesla, which is making cars, which, is not, uh, which are not run by petrol, um, by, by electricity, as you know. Um, so he was also a victim of bullying. Uh, so the right 
to be free from all forms of uh, violence, whether it ca it's coming from the public or the private, it's all in the constitution. The other one is the right not to be tortured um, in any way by other learners or members of gangs and the right to be treated, um, not to be treated or, or, or punished in a cruel, inhuman and degrading manner. Um, because that would be infringing on the human dignity of the other learners. The, the, the sixth rights here, number six, is that everybody has the right to bodily and psychological integrity. What do we mean by this? Um, we mean integrity means your wholeness. It means your hope. So it means nobody has the right to, um, to beat you up or to grievously attack uh, your body, um, otherwise they'll be charged with what we call um, grievous bodily harm, GBH, which is, which is against the law in South Africa. So you've got the right, and psychologically, because bullying sometimes can be psychological, me meaning that you attack the mental state of another learner. In what way? Somebody can go to another learner and say, you are very ugly. Or, or your shoes are ugly or whatever, in a way that degrades them, um, it is not allowed. So psychologically, you torment them in the mind, mental torment, it's not allowed. Um, and then the right number seven from the constitution is that every learner has got the right to privacy. Um, what we mean by privacy, and that's why you see in most schools, learners have got their own lockers where they can put in their own property, their school bags, their own drinks or whatever they need to, um, or, or their stationery or books, um, the, to privacy basically, that they, they, they need to be respected. Their space, they, to their own personal spaces, and that needs to be respected. And, and ownership of their own things. Um, and that, you know, nobody steals their properties uh, or something that belongs to them, uh, which is private property. And then right number eight uh, from the constitution is that everyone has the right to freedom of religion, uh, freedom of belief and freedom of opinion. And, and let me explain what I mean by this. Um, the freedom of religion. South Africa is a multicultural society, multilingual society, and also multi-religious, multi-ethnic society. So it means we accommodate um, everybody. And, and, and so we've got different religions in South Africa. Um, we, we have uh, Christians, we've got Muslims, we've got uh, atheists, the people who do not believe in anything. Um, and so, so everybody's right has to be respected. Um, and, and so that it right to religion. So if I have to pray in terms of my own religion, I will be allowed, I must be allowed to pray. And if I'm a Muslim and I pray at 12 o'clock and I have to face Mecca, I must be allowed to do that. So that's why in South African events, most national days, uh, your Freedom Day um, or any other Heritage Day, what we do is before the president speaks, there will be multi-denominational speakers, people who will pray um, in, 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 in every religion, Christianity, Muslim, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, right to believe, again, it's you believe whatever you are entitled to believe, and also the right to your own opinion. Um, because everybody, we think differently. We all hold, we are not the same. We are all different. Out of the 7 billion people in the world and the 55 million South Africans, we all hold different views and they must be respected. So you no view it's more important than another one. So no learner must be able to impose their own opinion. So everybody's opinion is important and they must be respected. Um, and, and then now let, let me come to the second last, 
um, um, right, num number nine, um, everyone has the right to the freedom of expression. Uh, now it's important that when you hold your own opinion, you must be able to express it. And, and what does this mean in a school context? If we are in a class and the teacher is asking a question, I must be able to express uh, the answer that I think is correct. Um, and also if it's a discussion or a debate in the school, I must be able to express my own opinion. Um, I must be given the space to express my views, my beliefs, uh, and my opinions, um, and, and like everybody else. Um, and then the final one, uh, just before the final one, everybody has the right to assembly, meaning um, people who want to get together must be allowed to get together. Uh, it doesn't matter who they are, whether it's, uh, it's religion, if the Muslims in the school want to be together, they must be, be allow, allowed to do that. If it's Christians, again, the same rule must apply. Or if um, it's a, it's a, it's if, if you are having uh, SRC elections, uh, people must be able to converse their own opinions um, and, 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 and be allowed given the space to do that. The final right is the right of association. Again, you associate with uh, like-minded individuals and you must be allowed to do so uh, without any hindrance by anybody and you must not be punished for doing so. And so these are basically the, uh, the rights that are in our own constitution and they go a long way um, towards um, um, dealing with, uh, with, with bullying. Um, they protect uh, and they learn us from, anti, you know, from bullying by other learners and I think we must respect it. And I think um, as learners, you must make sure that, that, that you know that you do have um, the constitution, particularly uh, chapter two, the bill of rights of the constitution so that you know your rights uh, in this regard. Uh, Chairperson, let me hand over back to you, uh, program director. I, I think it's important that uh, we have uh, spoken about this constitutional rights. Thank you very much, Dr. Matoma, for reminding us of those rights. And thank you again for sharing that story about Elon Musk. We can all see that you can overcome bullying. I think it's also important to remember that as much as we have these rights learners, you also do not have the right to infringe on the rights of others. So now I would like to call upon our last speaker, who is Ms. Njagulo Zulu. Njagulo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Program Director. Hello, everyone. As they have said, my name is Njagulo Zulu, and I'm 14 years old, and I am a grade eight learner from the Shangube Technical High School. So, well, basically, I, uh, I was bullied at school. Um, I was bullied about how I look. I was bullied about my dark skin complexion. From grade one up until grade four, I was told that I'm black, I'm not beautiful, I don't deserve to live. I look like a shoe polish. So that made me to hate myself. Like That made me not to love myself, not to take care of myself. And, that crushed me down inside and then like my mom could see through me um that something was happening but when she asked me i refused i was like no mommy nothing is happening but she could see that something is happening but until one day i told her what was happening i told her that i am being bullied at school i told her that i'm told that i'm black and i'm not beautiful then she went to the school and talked with the principal and then everything was resolved and everything was fine. And then I outcame bullying. And then um, now I am a motivational speaker, a violin player, a drama student, a sign language student, a preacher, and also an anti-bullying activist. So 
I would like to tell you that if you are being bullied, come out and talk. If you are being bullied, don't be afraid. Don't sit in that corner and think that somebody's finally going to come and help you. No, you must help yourself. You must stand up and talk. Talk to someone who you trust. It can be your parents, your school teachers, your school principal, your friend, but make sure that you speak out and find help before you can kill yourself because bullying also leads to committing suicide. So if you're being bullied, come out and talk. And if you are a bully and you suspect that you are bullied, I plead and ask you to please stop what you're doing. Stop bullying because it's, it's crushing somebody inside. What you're doing is hurting somebody. What you're doing can kill somebody. Do you want to be a murderer while you're young? No, you don't want to. So stop bullying because we all know that bullying is a bad, bad thing. So let us all stop bullying. And if you are being bullied, come out and talk. Let us all unite and become friends. Let us all unite and become one. Let us not be separated by bullying. No, let us not do that. But I would advise you that you have goals, you set goals so that you can be able to know what you want to be when you grow up. For example, you wanna be a doctor, TV presenter, you wanna be a pharmacist, you wanna be a lawyer, a pilot. Just have goals, like simple goals, like maybe next month um, you wanna pass your school test. Then what you can do is that you can study, you know, you must study and that you can set your mind to it you know like um where you can say okay let me plan this i want to pass my test study the good things that you need to study fill your head with good things and not bad things don't be allowed to be taken by peer pressure don't let peer pressure pressurize you to stop being who you are don't change yourself be who you are be who you want to be and don't do don't be something that you don't want to be. Don't be, maybe for instance, you want to be an NS because your friends wants to be an NS. No, be what you want to be. Know what your heart wants. Just do what you want to do so that you can have a better life when you grow up. Become a wise child. Become a wise teen so that when you grow up, you can become a wise adult. Let us all respect. Let us all have respect. And let us all remember to be who we are, let us not change ourselves. Let us not change ourselves. Let us all love ourselves. Let us all realize our inner beauty. Let us all know that we are all beautiful, no matter what we are being told. Just know who you are. Do not allow to be defined by somebody else. No, be able to define yourself. Know who you are. Know the inner of you. Know what you want to become, as I have said before. So let us all love ourselves, be ourselves, and let us not be pressurized by our peers. Let us all become wise teens, wise children, and so that when we grow up, we can become wise adults. Thank you.